much. And of course, it's a pleasure to be here and to be part of the Extraordinary Zero project. We all wish we were in Vienna with you, you know that, but we'll do the best we can. And so my name is Susan Scott Parker from Business Disability International, and I've been an ambassador for the Zero Project for, from, the, from the very first conference, come to think of it. I want to welcome you to our session today, brought together by Sylvana Lacus and her team at LUPD in the Lebanon. Our topic is important. We're looking at how a strategic approach to inclusive technology could help to drive the rebuild in such a way in the Middle East that people with disabilities gain back the ground they've lost during the trauma caused by the COVID crisis. And actually, with if we get this right, uh, use it as an opportunity to enhance the way in which we enable their life chances across the region. So we have a very distinguished group of speakers. I'm going to introduce them now so that we can move quickly through a series of presentations. And then I'm hoping we'll have some time at the end of this session to take perhaps some questions coming through the chat box. If you uh, would log them for us, I'd be grateful. Or perhaps open it up to questions from our, our participants, our audience, before we finish in, in 57 minutes time. So our speakers today, we have Stefan Trommel from the ILO, uh, and of course, Stefan leads the work of the Global Business Disability Network. He'll be talking about promoting decent work for people with disabilities in the times of the pandemic. Then we have Dr. Mohammed Ali Lufi, who is from the Global Initiative for Inclusive ICT, uh, better known as G3ICT. And that presentation will look at how we make digital workplaces truly accessible. Then we have Deepti Samant Raja from the World Bank, the World Bank's approach to inclusive employment and resilient recovery in a post-COVID world, a world, by the way, which I hope we hit very soon indeed. Then David Baines from David Baines Access and Inclusion Services. Dave is looking in particular at the five barriers to accommodation that small businesses in the region encounter. And of course, most businesses in that region will be small. And then finally, but not last, we have Sylvana Lakis from Disabled Peoples International, as well, of course, as from LPUD. She is the chair of the Arab Forum for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and co-chair of Disabled People International. And she's quite rightly going to look at the role of international organizations in promoting inclusive uh, employment opportunities in the region. So as I say, that's quite a lineup. Um, and if I may, I'd like to just start immediately. Oh, I'm assuming that everyone has, um, is going, our guests are going to go uh, put their cameras down. We'll only have the person speaking uh, visible for you. And I'm sure that all the participants will also have uh, their microphones muted. So Stefan, I'm going to kick off with you and the ILO's truly global vision um, but perhaps with a focus on this region in particular, um, who needs to do what differently, Stefan, if we're going to get this right? Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I, I must admit, uh, I'm, uh, I'm surprised to be the first speaker, <laughs> according to my program. I was the second last, which uh, gave me a lot of time to relax and just uh, try to add to what others have already said. But anyway, um, you, you gave me a minute to sort of re strategize my, my presentation. Um, well, th thanks. Thanks first and foremost to um, to LUPD for um, for inviting me to the to the session. Um, I will focus, as Susan, as, as you've said, I will focus a bit on um, on our work at, at global level. Uh, but it's also interesting, and I, I bring it a bit because I've just uh, just by mere coincidence, I was listening in this morning um, to a presentation from a consultant who has been working on the on the barriers that. Um, from an employer perspective um, um, that people with disabilities face in, in, in Lebanon. Uh, Silvana, you will know about this uh, collaboration between um, the new UNESCO and, and ILO and that. And um, nothing particularly um, new came out of that, but, it, but, um, but at least there was some interesting evidence uh, of things that we, that we seem to know. Now, um, the, this year, the ILO Global Business and Disability Network had initially planned um, I said last year, 2020, 
in the in, in the beginning of the year we had plans to um, to focus in 2020 on on the issue of climate change green jobs it's an issue that's also mentioned in, in some other uh, sessions of the zero project conference but then covid 19 came and i think as many many others we had to immediately reassess our our work priorities and it, it became clear quite soon that a uh, focus on digital economy digital transformation uh, should be our main focus for for this year no? and that has that led us uh, in collaboration with uh, other partners with whom we already had worked also um, back in 2019 uh, working on a, on a report on the on the future of work and how to make it inclusive of persons with disabilities we decided to zoom in on the digital economy and in fact we are launching to later today at 5 p.m so a small pitch uh, a publication looking at how to make the digital economy inclusive of persons with disabilities. The three main uh, headlines that, 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 that I can share from that is on one hand, of course, it, it is about accessibility of, um, of, of, of tools, of platforms, it's the whole telework dimension. Um, it's also, of course, very importantly, um, and that's, that's a huge uh, responsibility also for public authorities, we need to ensure that persons with disabilities have access to the digital skills that the labor market is demanding, both for jobs that are purely digital, so to say, like cloud computing, uh, data analysts, uh, cybersecurity professionals, but also the increasing number of jobs that have an important digital component. And if we don't address those issues in terms of skills, upskilling, reskilling, initial skilling, uh, there's a huge risk that people with disabilities will be left out of this um, of the digital economy. Uh, and the third element, of course, is there are a number of initiatives that governments are implementing right now um, to promote digital skills, also but also jobs, in particular also as, uh, as digital transformation uh, is, is seen as part of the key element of the strategy to take us out of the COVID-19 pandemic. No? And our message in that publication is really we need to make a concerted effort that so that persons with disabilities are central of these uh, of these strategies are really benefiting from um, from the initiatives that will deal with um, with digital uh, transformation. Now I don't need to, to say we, we've all said uh, look uh, COVID nineteen uh, has accelerated transformation and and that and, and that is true. We are all struggling with, uh, with with telework related issues. We are getting used to that. We have seen how. Um, how quickly organizations have been able to, to adjust to, to the new situation. And uh, we've seen even quotes from companies saying, look, in, in, we've done in eight weeks what we perhaps would have otherwise only have done in, in five years. No? And, and much of those efforts have been done reasonably disability inclusive. Um, others, not so much, but, um, but I think it's, it's, that's, that's, that's reasonably okay. Now, I want to raise one, one one issue, one issue that sort of keeps a bit in, in concerning me in, my, in my head, because sometimes some of the things we have been reading these days is like, now thanks to the pandemic, uh, we are all disabled, or we are all able. I mean, you can you can put it in, in both directions. Huh? And I mean, I understand the, the message there, which is of course now we we people that require teleworking um, can do so and benefits many persons with disabilities. But we also need to remember many of those that have jobs which cannot be delivered through. It's the whole breaking down barriers, it's communication, technologies have been improved and usually have been, uh, and that has benefited also persons with disabilities. And, but sometimes I've also heard this message like saying, well, you know, now I no longer need to disclose my disability you know, because I can go to an interview and, and I think, and, and that, that message I don't like so much because I think on one hand, we are we are very much insisting on the on the on the on the talent and the, and the benefit for for organizations in, in employing persons with disabilities because they bring to organizations uh, a diverse uh, a new point of view that they bring they add diversity they add talent and I think that talent requires an identification of disability but it's also the whole issue of um, of disclosure and bringing your own self to the organizations and I think we have looked at that. In different diversity contexts, but also in disability, and I think if, if we're now moving to a situation where people feel that now, thanks to this new way of working, um, people will no longer need to disclose their disability, I don't. I think I have a problem with 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 that. 
anyway, that, that was um, a few things I want to say. Just from what I, what I heard this, this morning from, from, the, from the presentation from the consultant in Lebanon, it were interesting things because they basically interviewed 80 organizations, almost like half and half organizations that already had already employed persons with disabilities and others that had not yet employed. And it was interesting to see that on one hand, there was a, a reminder of some of the, the prejudices and stereotypes, you know, people with disabilities are not productive, uh, reasonable accommodation, they cost a lot of money, very complicated, et cetera, et cetera, versus then the actual reality of companies or organizations that had employed persons with disabilities, they were basically saying, well, most of them have not required any adjustment and there has been a significant positive impact um, on, our, on, um, on our organization. And also very interesting to see that. And uh, the last message that came very strongly also from the, from the presentation this morning, I think it's, it's one of the, the additional challenges that uh, exist in, in, in the Arab region, which is the, the, the huge imbalance between men and, and women. It's, it's like 80%, 80, 20, percent uh, difference between uh, men with disabilities and, and women with disabilities. And I think that, of course, I think especially in, that I would say is, is one of the most uh, distinct features of, of, of the Arab context is this huge imbalance. I mean, the, the imbalance is usually everywhere, but the level of the imbalance in, in, the, in the Arab region is, is particularly stark. Susan, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and um, uh, th thanks again. Well, you left me feeling guilty. I've checked and I think I had you as the first speaker. <laughs> you did fine anyway under pressure. I just want to say in terms of your point, Stefan, about we're all disabled now, this kind of theme that we're hearing. I think what we're also hearing is there's an opportunity to reinforce the message that, yes, we have to give everyone the tools and flexibility and accessibility that they need in order to do their jobs. But we have to remind people that you can only do that for everyone if the employer has the disability expertise they need in order to make that work in terms of how they deliver workplace adjustments efficiently and equitably. So thank you very much for that. I'd like to move on now to Dr. Mohammed Ali Lutfi from G3ICT's perspective. Are you there, Mohammed? Mohammed? Currently, Mohammed? yes. Ah, uh, there you are. I knew you were there. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I'm trying to activate my uh, voiceover thing. Anyway, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Susan. Thank you very much, Silvana, and to LUPD for inviting me to this session. Um, it's uh, very dear to me to be part of it because you know I'm originally from Lebanon and I worked with Silvana for many, many years. And uh, it's uh, the issue of persons issues of persons with disabilities in of Mena in Mena region um, uh, are so dear to me as well. Um, as we are talking today about the uh, situation of persons with disabilities during the pandemic and uh, how the pandemic has affected their uh, uh, employment opportunities, uh, we know that millions of persons with disabilities, according to reports from the World Bank, from ILO, and also from uh, the stakeholder group of persons with disabilities to the high-level political forum, uh, International Disability Alliance, and many others uh, that millions of persons with disabilities have lost their jobs. But uh, in order to understand the situation, uh, even though the pandemic has caused drastic outcomes on opportunities of employment and the continuation of uh, 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 you know, enrollment of persons with disabilities in the workforce, um, especially in the global south, let's tr let's let's understand let's or let, let's look at the picture of employment. And as we are talking about inclusive ICTs uh, today, how the world uh, looks at, in terms of the deployment of inclusive ICT programs and policies and their actual outcomes on the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the labor market uh, prior to the pandemic. And of course, it's it worsened because of the pandemic, according to uh, our DARE Index report of 2020 uh, uh, that has been uh, conducted uh, in partnership uh, between G3ICT and Disabled Peoples International, we uh, we, we identified number uh, like uh, a bunch of figures uh, which tell us tells us what the situation is. Um, we know uh, G, the DARE Index. Uh, covered 137 countries of uh, those who have ratified 
the uh, uh, CRPD, um, only 54% um, of these countries have programs and policies in place. These programs uh, in consist of uh, both like partnership, uh, uh, public private partnership policies and programs of the percentage of 57% uh, uh, public policies and programs public by the public sector, I mean, uh, uh, 26% and the private sector it has only 17% of these countries have programs and policies on ICT, inclusion, inclusive ICT in the workplace. Now, uh, but however, if we look at the actual outcomes, i.e. the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the work, workplace because of ICT, we only see 23% of these countries have achieved these such outcome. Now, um, if we just look at the uh, rate of, or the percentage of uh, ICT, inclusive ICT in, in the workplace, according to the economic develop, development level of countries, we see that only 8% in, in low, middle, low, low income countries, 18% in lower income country, lower middle income countries, and 21% uh, 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 in the upper middle countries, and 43% uh, in high income countries. Now, according to a report that uh, uh, was released by Accenture in 2017, uh, and of course, based on our work at G3ICT, uh, through different in, in, in initiatives that uh, we have in place today, such as the Neurability uh, 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 Project Initiative, we realize that uh, uh, um, cognitive artificial intelligence technologies, such as uh, uh, robotics, uh, big data analytics, and so on and so forth, uh, is going to increase uh, in terms of its impact on the labor market, for example, in, 22, uh, in 2022, according to Accenture report, uh, we, we see that uh, the, 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 uh, in, the revenues level uh, based on the usage of uh, inclusive ICT in the workplace is going to increase 38%. Employment opportunities will increase 10%. Now, um, uh, uh, what we are planning to do as G3ICT, or what we think that G3ICT, and it, through its partnership with multi-sectoral multi uh, organizations, uh, companies, private sector, international organizations like ILO, the World Bank, uh, like uh, the Disability Business International, and many others, uh, we, we need to see that uh, it's important to focus on uh, engaging in advocacy or uh, pressuring governments to, uh, you know, uh, adopt more policies that would enhance its commitment to uh, inclusive ICT in the workplace. Um, we need to see that uh, we uh, we have more uh, programs at major universities and uh, professional education uh, uh, programs and services uh, would. To be to be also in in place, knowing that only uh, 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 thirty eight percent of countries that have been covered by the by the Dare Index has uh, have uh, 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 such programs at their major universities. Um, now, the other thing what we see is very important that uh, 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 we need to see more. Uh, uh, work with persons with disabilities and their organizations. Number one, to offer opportunities of empowerment and capacity building with practical knowledge and uh, like uh, uh, and professional training to make sure that they are compatible, uh, sorry, capable of engaging with new technologies uh, of, uh, of the digital economies. Um, and we need to make sure that they are a, they are a, able to use these uh, technologies so they can uh, in, ensure uh, uh, actual uh, career development uh, through many pathways and, of course, in, improve their skills. Um, so this is what we are uh, envisioning to do as G3ICT to focus more on advocacy and also 
uh, capacity building uh, with uh, persons with disabilities and their organizations because from what we realized through the their index report that despite all of the uh, increase in interest in terms of inclusive ICTs, uh, persons with disabilities are still not uh, fully aware of the significance of inclusive ICT or what we mean by inclusive ICTs. Uh, so we need to enhance this kind of knowledge practically and uh, more professionally. Um, and uh, definitely I look forward to ha receive, having, um, receiving questions and uh, we are looking forward to, uh, you know, continue our partnership with uh, many of you who are on the panel here and, and many others uh, as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mohammed. I think everyone in a very practical way can be determined that we prepare people with disabilities for the jobs that are coming, for the jobs that will be in demand. And many of those jobs, as you say, are going to be related to technology. So if I could move on now um, and introduce Deepti Samant Raja from the World Bank. And so Deepti, if you could introduce us to your perspective. Thank you so much, Susan. And my sincere thanks to LUPD for organizing this important session. I think in some ways I am going to second uh, some of the remarks already made and uh, try and offer a broader macro ecosystem level perspective on what we can collectively do. You know, last year when the pandemic was uh, really surging, there were statistics coming out that four out of five people in the global workforce had been affected by full or partial pandemic related workplace closures. I mean, for persons with disabilities, I think this has raised two significant concerns, right? One is we wanna make sure that we don't slide back on some of the hard won gains made in advancing inclusive employment so far. And second, that persons with disabilities are not excluded um, as we develop post COVID. And Susan, very much agree with you that hopefully we are getting to a post COVID world soon, but that they're not excluded um, in post COVID recovery context. So, the World Bank's approach has really been very much about supporting countries as they grapple with continuing issues of immediate crisis relief and response, but making sure that we don't lose sight of the long-term goal of making sure that post-COVID recoveries are inclusive and very much inclusive of persons with disabilities. They're resilient to future shocks uh, as much as possible and they're sustainable. You know, when we talk about inclusive employment, I think all of us know that we're not just talking about some sort of a formal system of job creation. We're really talking about a pretty complex and multi-sectoral ecosystem, which has been badly impacted by the pandemic. What do I mean by that? And um, Stefan certainly alluded to many of these things, which, you know, when we just think about employment situations, yes, the pandemic really hit hard jobs that were dependent on in-person services, that were dependent on the ability to travel. And for persons with disabilities, many of whom remain self-employed, this really hit their ability to continue, you know, their financial stability. Uh, for those who were employed, uh, there may have been situations where their inclusive workplace uh, or workstations in the office weren't as quickly replicated at the home. Uh, but moving beyond that, you know, with all of the lockdowns, that also hit hard tertiary education systems. It, hard, it hit hard uh, TVET programs. So that has caused some significant disruptions in the continuity of skills gaining, uh, in the continuity of uh, acquiring your certifications. And that's really going to impact uh, you know, students and youth with disabilities as they then try to get into the marketplace. And I think at a more uh, systems level, you know, I think the pandemic really exposed and amplified some divides that have just either gone unnoticed or unaddressed for a very long time, right? So for example, just thinking about digital connectivity. Uh, so in terms of countries, infrastructural ability to sustain the significant surges of demand that happened with everybody trying to study and work online. 
but also recognizing the lowered access uh, of a lot of households of persons with disabilities to internet connectivity, to broadband access, to access to digital devices at home, to assistive technologies at home. So I, I think when we really think about resilient recovery, we are looking at pushing development investments in many different sectors. Um, and I, I, I think in a way it is a chance for us to push for some long overdue investments, right? So when it comes to access to digital technologies, when it comes to access to education across the life cycle of education, and of course, inclusive income generation and livelihoods. So let me touch upon um, four or five, I think, uh, sectoral level investments that the World Bank is certainly looking at, but I think collectively as a field are crucial for us. Um, the first, and I know it doesn't maybe seem immediately connected, but it is, right? Ensuring access to vaccination um, and making sure that persons with disabilities are very much a part of the early vaccination drives, which is going to allow for a faster recovery and reopening of countries. And because we are focusing on the Arab region, um, I do want to mention that actually the first World Bank financed operation to fund the procurement of COVID-19 vaccines was just approved for Lebanon, um, an operation of about 34 million, which will go to provide vaccines for over 2 million individuals. And for the World Bank, this is directly being tied actually to the goal of supporting economic recovery and saving livelihoods. Um, you know, Stefan already alluded to some of these things, but we need to think about assessing the disruptions that have happened in skills acquisition and learning losses for students and youth with disabilities. And what does that mean? It means that we want to try and mitigate the losses that are happening due to the crisis, but we want to make sure that persons with disabilities then have access to new skills development. Um, and I think this is very crucial when we are all talking about the digital nature of the future of work, right? So we very much have to invest in digital skills, but those are demand-led skilling, upskilling opportunities, and skills that allow for, or rather opportunities that allow for social skills, interpersonal skills, job readiness skills. You know, as part of the work that the World Bank's Global Disability Inclusion Team does, we are developing some very action-oriented technical guidance to both support our staff, but to then also support our government partners. And how do you very consciously think about disability inclusive project components, not just in jobs and economic transformation projects, but also in social protection projects? How can you link this to good safety nets and um, you know, improved or reformed social protection systems? There are also, I think, some lessons we can learn from projects that are not so focused on digital inclusive economies. Um, and I'd like to give, if I may, an example from India, actually, where as part of the World Bank's COVID-19 response on rural livelihoods, um, there were some very interesting good practices that came out that I think apply even to digital, you know, digital jobs. And that were, and some of those practices were including persons with disabilities very proactively during social mobilization, making sure that they are a part of their community self-help group so they have a voice in what's happening in their community's recovery systems, uh, making sure that there was an assessment of uh, the needs of persons with disabilities, giving them individual assistance, to, you know, depending on whether they had their own small businesses or not. And I think these are practices that apply no matter what types of jobs we're looking at. Um, of course, investing in digital development, and I think making sure that going forward, uh, all of the financing that's going to go towards digital development is very conscious, I think, of the divides that households of persons with disabilities face. Um, finally, uh, one of the things I'd like to say is, I know we say this pretty much constantly, in all disability inclusive development, um, I think for our conversations, but it remains crucial, which is that we have to continue to push for inclusive disability disaggregated data. You know, uh, when this, when the whole thing started, and even at the World Bank, when we got uh, a lot of, um, what should I say, requests for support, they always started with, can you tell us how many persons with disabilities are impacted 
how they are impacted. And I think our field overall struggles with the lack of access to data. So I think we have to continue to push to make sure that they're included in household and labor market surveys, that they that we know how COVID-19 has impacted them and we monitor how they are included in, in inclusive recovery. I'll stop there. Thank you. This is such a, a cross sectional con uh, conversation, as you say, it would be interesting to to uh, be able to spend much more time with each of you on these things. But I'm going to jump now to David Baines. David, you've got a lot of experience working in the Arab region, so I'm looking forward to your remarks. Thank you, Susan. It's very kind. Um, yeah, it's been my privilege to work in uh, a number of countries uh, over the last uh, 10 years and so across the Arab region. And really, when I was thinking about COVID and the impact on employment, I was reminded of the scale of small businesses within the region. Uh, and looking just at Lebanon, uh, when I was looking at some statistics, um, the current made, and it's taken from the World Bank, uh, thank you, Dipti, 90% uh, of businesses and 60% of employment in Lebanon is in the small and medium-sized business sector. Um, and many of those are family-run businesses. So when we talk about employment, we need to remember that many of these businesses are not large corporates with large amounts of resources to draw upon. Um, and that many of the, the startups and the companies that are beginning uh, in Lebanon uh, and other regions are gonna be small family businesses. And those, those sectors are not well supported within the Arab region, or in fact, probably in most of the world uh, in terms of access and inclusion of people with disabilities. And as I've been talking to uh, business owners, small business owners, we, we talk about some of the challenges that they particularly face and why they find it difficult to employ people with disabilities. Without doubt that the first factor, the first barrier they face is uh, in the area of advice. Getting practical and pragmatic independent advice based on real knowledge and experience is very hard for them to obtain. They often feel um, that the advice they get, the information they get, is much more targeted on a campaigning basis, telling them what they must do based on a rights-based model, rather than how to do it with the constraints and the nature of the businesses that they run. When they then turn to international advice, uh, it's, it's often not entirely relevant. It fails to understand the needs of the employer and is based upon misconceptions of their obligations under local law. So advice is without doubt the first barrier, and it's a significant one. And with that barriers that are created by lack of uh, suitable advice are challenges and fears around cost. Small businesses have a tendency to assume that the cost of accommodations will be much higher than it needs to be. And that's partly driven by this issue that much of the information about accommodations, when they search for it, is driven by uh, the pr uh, private sector companies providing those accommodation. And it often looks expensive, consultancy, advice, products, implementation, and so on. And that's reinforced by a lot of the messaging around a large scale accommodations uh, by major corporates. And they feel very strongly that the experience of large corporates cannot, often cannot easily be applied to their experience. And as a result, they believe they cannot possibly make appropriate accommodations. So they don't start down that process. Some of this is really, really important in the post-COVID world, uh, in that uh, small businesses have been especially challenged uh, by COVID. Uh, many of them have been closed down, locked down, they've had to change their business model. And with all of that, it's perhaps not surprising that the next major stress faced by companies uh, is time. Uh, SMEs are seriously time constrained. Um, and when those other pressures, such as COVID, emerge, 
the time that they have to apply accommodations is really significant. Um, often a single person, a manager, an owner, perhaps with an administrator, which might be outsourced, uh, run the company. And keeping anybody in employment, keeping the business afloat is their priority. They may well aspire uh, to make accommodations, to be inclusive, to do what they believe to be the right thing. But it's really very, very challenging during tough economic times. And that's further reflected um, in some of the advice they get around accommodations that relate to use of physical space. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, SMEs on the whole seek to minimize their space requirements because unused space is um, money that's not required. Physical accommodations often require reuse of space that is both costly and challenging. So accommodations for disabled employees, which reduce space for customers, are particularly difficult at the moment. Customer space is the basis of sales and income. Whether that's a shop and, what, and the amount of stock you can carry on your shelves, whether it's a restaurant and the number of tables uh, for diners that you can have available, um, whatever the, the sector, space is really important to profitability. So we need to understand that making physical accommodations that reduce uh, the space in which things are sold is difficult for SMEs. And the final one, um, and I think really this was touched upon earlier, is ease of recruitment and the availability of skilled staff with disabilities, not through any result of the people with disabilities themselves, but because of historic failings of schooling and educational systems in the past. Adult learning, lifelong learning uh, is really very, very important uh, in preparing people for the workforce, particularly in the changing settings that we're in. It will be really interesting to see what comes back post COVID in terms of the growth of what we've referred to in the past as the gig economy. Probably the, the smallest businesses of all are when you're self-employed and the gig economy, whether it's been driving, delivering, whatever, uh, has been a, an increasing growth area. There's no doubt SMEs are willing to invest in people with disabilities, but investing that time, effort and money is challenging for them. Really, when we talk about how we approach these issues within the Arab region uh, for SMEs, we need to encourage incentives for the sector. They need to be carefully tailored to the needs of small businesses. To go back, perhaps it's not surprising that the numbers of people with a disability employed within communities is so much smaller when they, than it appears, and it is so difficult for them to be employed within the small and medium sized sector. Simple, clear information and resources are essential if we're going to make progress in this area. Thanks. Thank you very much, David. That was very clear. And certainly I see as a, as a strategy simply the statement, we will make it easier for employers, including the small business community, drives a very important set of reforms across any labor market, particularly now. Thank you. And so if uh, our final speaker then, if I could bring Silvana Lacus. Silvana, you've brought us together uh, for this important session. I'm very interested to hear what you think the role of the international development community needs to be if the if the region is going to thrive post COVID? Well, first, Susan, allow me to to again uh, uh, give a big thank to Zero Project for uh, making this annual uh, important platform a, a very essential part of our process of struggle and work. And I want to thank you personally. Personally, uh, you you have uh, accompanied us since uh, the early 2000s, I think, and uh, our distinguished speakers. And uh, you make uh, uh, you all together, I think, makes a big opportunity for us to.
to widen the scope of all in this Arab region. Um, it, it's very hard to to talk after you, but I will try to to highlight the based on our uh, situation in Lebanon and the region, what are the challenges? Well, already uh, uh, people with disability uh, are still facing this stereotype culture in the region, which is the one of the basic uh, barrier. And uh, with COVID-19, the pandemic, and with the economic crisis and uh, um, not having a proper good governance, all this together, plus wars going on in, in the region in different areas. And uh, lately in Lebanon, in Beirut, the uh, Beirut blast, which has also caused um, around uh, 800 persons with disabilities because of the blast. Uh, well, now uh, we have, we are more and more relying on the international uh, support and the contribution. And when you are in emergency, uh, as some of you have already mentioned, uh, the issue of advocacy is not uh, is not uh, supported, not possible to be supported. Uh, yet, um, to do resilience recovery and to try and uh, achieve, uh, let's say, social protection, which includes the package of uh, of rights, uh, basic rights, uh, it is at the same time an opportunity to try and uh, promote inclusive employment and uh, ICT. On one level, the whole region is talking about this transition towards a digital uh, uh, world. But uh, at the same time, we have big challenge, which is our governments are not being able to move from micro to, ma to macro. So we keep witnessing uh, micro initiatives, which does not survive to reach and become an, uh, a national policy and uh, mainstream. Uh, people with disability in, uh, in the Arab region are still left behind. They are not doing okay. They are not included within the systems. They are still treated apart. Of course, there are initiatives. There are uh, countries uh, like maybe in the Gulf due to maybe available resources are being able to do some achievements, but uh, to um, to really you know, go forward, we need to uh, review the current uh, interventions coming from. They give hope. They give. Uh, you know, they are filling the gap now, and they can make the, a real difference. We need to put to join forces together to make sure that when, when such organization like the World Bank, for example, uh, when they are giving the government loans or grants to make sure to consult with uh, uh, people with disabilities organizations, uh, parents organizations who, who advocate for their children, to make sure that uh, they are uh, consulting with and working with to design an inclusive uh, 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 programs with whatever they are presenting. Because at the moment, uh, although we have like um, uh, 
uh, an initiative that is very important happening in Lebanon together with the ILO and uh, UNICEF. Uh, we are trying to put a strategy and a plan for inclusive employment, but this will be stuck if we are not collaborating enough with uh, the main uh, uh, organizations that are making difference in Lebanon. Now we have unemployment that is expected, for example, to structurally uh, get uh, up to 30% in Lebanon. In such a situation, and it is expected that situation is going to get even harder. So how can we, in such situation, ensure that the initiatives coming from international organizations can do the uh, possible that they can to, to, uh, to create this platform where people with disabilities are able to, uh, to participate in the designing and in the monitoring for uh, the jobs opportunities for the, for the recovery phase. Because I know from the uh, from from uh, uh, the work we've been doing together, how high the challenges are. Uh, we need to convince the wider community that make decisions to uh, support the pilot of inclusive employment. And uh, for example, David, you've mentioned. Uh, the small businesses, the startup, which is a lot in Lebanon. Yes, that's true. But these startups do miss protection, do miss uh, a basic knee, uh, good, proper uh, taxation system that can enable them to survive and other issues. People with disabilities currently are uh, the most vulnerable and the poorest. Uh, I cannot explain how difficult the situation is. And uh, the only hope we can get is to really make space for inclusive uh, jobs. Now, there is another opportunity, which is the reform plan. The international community is asking our government and maybe others in the Arab region to do some reforms. We need to be clever enough and uh, we need to have space to make these, uh, to include inside these reforms, inclusion criteria, disabilities inclusion criteria, so that we don't miss again the opportunities. And also it is linked with the rebuilding of the, the cities. So Beirut, uh, almost third of Beirut was destroyed lately with the blast. This should not be allowed to be rebuilt again without making sure that it is going to be uh, inclusive by all with a global meaning for buildings, for technology, and for uh, management and services. Um, it is important that we can all contribute to make sure that whoever the donors and the big grantees are going to be to convince uh, them to adopt accessibility because if they if it is not it means we are again blocking on uh, inclusion of people with disability who make uh, about 15% of the population in the Arab region and in Lebanon. Uh, I think I have uh, taken my time. Did you just want to conclude your remarks? Yes, uh, I really, uh, uh, despite all the uh, sadness that exists in the region now, I do believe in uh, uh, in justice, and uh, I do believe that when people come together with a lot of love, can really bring justice to and peace to everyone. 
and uh, this includes uh, redesigning the space on equal basis for to to be a welcoming space for everyone by that way only we can ensure um, uh, justice for everyone i want to thank you and i i hope that we meet very soon uh, in and in a process of work to support whoever might be doing uh, good work in this region for making uh, inclusive employment for everyone. Thank, Thank you me. very much, Solana. And actually, you've raised a couple of interesting questions that we've got an opportunity now, five minutes perhaps, to just think about a little. I'd like to turn to both our colleagues from the World Bank and the ILO to say, so that is questions about how the international community can, for example, ensure that any reform plan in Beirut or the region, make sure people with disabilities are factored in as key stakeholders. And that would include, of course, the rebuild question, which is very interesting. How do you make sure that if you're putting money into rebuilding Beirut, it turns into an accessible city? So Deepti, would you like to just take that for a minute? What would you do in Sylvana's shoes? What can people on the ground in the region do that would make it easier for your institution and others to get this right? Thank you so much, Susan. And I'll try to be very brief because yes, I think there is uh, a lot, you know, there are things that people in Sylvana's position can do, but I want to assume the responsibility also as a financing institution about what we can do to also meet uh, and make sure that organizations of persons with disabilities are involved in the recovery process. And what I want to talk about um, is that within the World Bank, we have now made it almost a requirement that when you are designing projects, that you make sure that persons with disabilities are actually included in your stakeholder engagement process, your, in your consultation processes that happen at the beginning so that you have a good sense of what their differentiated needs are. Uh, our team, the Global Disability Inclusion Team, is also pushing to make sure that, that it's not just that you go ahead and have a consultation, that you then make sure that those needs are incorporated into differentiated project design. So you're really addressing the needs of persons with disabilities. And um, I, I think that's very critical. Um, and at least I want to say that uh, from all of everything that I have seen from the World Bank's uh, COVID-19 approach, they have made inclusion as a core central theme of what they want to do. So we will ensure that the pressure remains from within as well. And is the statement that, that the World Bank has this policy, is that in the public domain? Is that something that Sylvana can readily find and share with other organizations perhaps to say, well, that's the World Bank is doing this, why not you? Yes, so the, the thing that I mentioned about the inclusive stakeholder consultations, uh, they are part of our environmental and social framework. That is basically the banks, what it used to be the bank safeguarding procedures in the beginning, but that applies to all of our investment projects as we are preparing them. So that's very much in the public domain. Excellent, thank you very much. And Stefan. What, what advice have you to give here? How do we ensure that these massive institutions often headquartered in New York or Geneva, a long way from Beirut, how do they, how do we encourage them to get this right? Well, I think the messages from the top are there, from the Secretary General, from the ILO, our Director General said uh, disability inclusive response is a res better response for everybody. And that's the immediate response and also the building back patch. Now this needs, the delivery now needs to happen at country level. All the UN entities and the World Bank, they all have offices in, in the region and it's, and it's there where this needs to be implemented. Um, we, we, we need to do better. And, but we need uh, champions, advocates like Silvana, uh, knocking our doors and, 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 and pushing our colleagues to that. They are faced with many challenges and there is always a problem that certain groups might be overlooked. We, but we have all the, 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 let's say the moral and, and we also have the know-how, it's much more there than, than before, but uh, we need just to keep uh, pushing and harassing. And I think, you know, as I look back at what David was saying, the more we can be seen to be facilitating rather than campaigning, the better off we are, facilitating the conversation. So going to your office, say 